this is where they had been playing for less than five minutes when the man came around the corner and pulled up and said, help me find my lost puppy. On July 15, 2002, Samantha Runyon's sixth birthday was just 11 days away, but she never got the chance to turn six because of an evil predator who had been out scouting for a victim to abduct. Unfortunately, Samantha just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. The summer of 2002 was known as the summer of child abductions by the media, and this caused a huge panic to wash across the United States. Samantha Runyon's abduction was one of many abductions that summer. Hello, my name is Holly. Welcome to the Murder She Shed, the place we discuss rarely told true crime right from my little she shed. Just make sure you smash that subscribe button, that one down there, in order to join me in the She Shed Weekly. Me and Simon, my little GS over here, would love to have you join us usually once, twice a week right here in our She Shed. But you can't join us if you forget to push the subscribe because who knows, you might not ever find us again. Also, to help me in the algorithms, could you leave a comment and a like? Also, I want to give a viewer discretion is advised because it was a very hard one for me to research and probably for you to hear. Samantha was a fun and beautiful little girl. She loved to put on shows for her family and entertain them with tap dancing. And she adored dressing up in princess costumes and smelling sunflowers. Samantha was already an avid reader and the family cheerleader who left notes and books and lunch boxes saying, Be brave and I love you. When her stepbrother Connor, 10 months younger than she was, learned to ride a bicycle, Samantha cheered him on with her pom-poms. Just a sweet little girl. Samantha was born in Boston, Massachusetts, but later moved to Stanton, California with her mother, Erin Runyon, after she separated from Samantha's father, Derek Jackson. She then married Ken Donnelly, Samantha's stepfather, who already had two children of his own, an older girl and then a younger son. On the evening of July 15th, Erin and Ken were at work. The family actually lived in Samantha's grandmother's home, and she was watching the children. Samantha and her grandmother had just got back from having ice cream at the pier when she asked her grandmother if she could go outside in the front yard and play with her best friend, Sarah. It was around 6.30 p.m., and it was a bright and beautiful day. As the pair sat in the grass having a tea party, they noticed a green car pass by. As they watched, the vehicle circled the block and reappeared, coming to a stop only a few feet away. Sarah recalled that the driver, who seemed friendly enough, had approached them and asked if they had seen a little puppy wandering around anywhere. Samantha, an avid animal lover, asked him what size the puppy was, and he told her it was a little chihuahua. Seconds later, he moved towards Samantha, grabbed her, and dragged her towards his car. He threw her into the car, and she was screaming and struggling and kicking, trying to get away from him. Sarah ran to tell her own mother what happened. Sarah was able to give a good description of the man and car and worked with the sketch artist to create a sketch. Samantha's little new body was found the next day in a remote area near Lake Elsinore, about 55 miles from Samantha's home. Her body had been placed in a provocative manner, so police feared it was the work of a serial killer. The autopsy performed the next morning revealed that Samantha had been essayed, both front and back. She had suffered at least two blows to the head about a half an hour before she died, which caused her brain to swell. But she was still alive even after that. I think she probably lived some time after that, in fact. She also had a severe neck compression, which they have no idea how she got that. But what killed her is that neck compression. Eventually, she actually suffocated. A hunt began for the killer. The governor offered a $50,000 reward for information leading to an arrest and conviction of Samantha's killer. The killer was eventually caught by tips that were called in. Three days after the murder, all evidence would point to Alejandro Avila, and he lived and resided near the lake where her little body had been found. Avila came from a dysfunctional and poor family. Avila's father was an alcoholic who beat him with a belt and called him a fairy whenever he got drunk. His mother would often not feed her children. His father would abuse him both physically and sexually. 
Avila met a woman named Beth during the summer of 1996, and they moved in together along with Beth's six-year-old girl, Catherine, who only stayed with her mother every other weekend. Catherine mostly lived with her dad, only a few houses down from Samantha's home. Beth would say she would often have to beg Avila for When they would have sex, he wanted her to dress in little girl's clothing, and he told her how much he liked blonde, blue-eyed girls. You would think that after she learned this, that Beth would never allow her daughter to be around this man. But nope, she let him babysit her. I guess I won't ever understand these things. If I had a husband that was making me dress up like little girl and I had a little girl, that would give me a lot of thoughts as, this is weird. Like, you know, you think it would. But to her, I guess it didn't trigger anything. Avila liked to bathe Catherine and wanted Beth to let Catherine sleep in their bed. He would show Catherine and often touched her. This would eventually lead to him having Catherine perform OS on him. He also forced Catherine to insert test tubes he had gotten from his work inside of her, telling her this was so when she got older, he could then have sex with her. Avila would also molest Catherine's cousin Alexis, who would sometimes visit Catherine. Alexis was only five years old when Avila asked her and Catherine to take off their clothes and play together. He also instructed both girls how to pleasure themselves. After Avila broke up with Beth, he moved into his friend Jose's home with him and his 11-year-old daughter, Kara. He asked her to touch him and then inserted a test tube inside of her too. He would tickle her legs and private parts and also choked her between 8 and 10 times. He was arrested for essaying Catherine and Alexis, but ended up being found not guilty. I don't know if the girls didn't testify against him. I don't know, but he got off scot-free. Avila told his sister Elvira that I can now do anything to that little girl that I want to, and I can't be charged for it because of the double jeopardy law. That's so sad. And you'll learn that he does decide to go try to do something to Catherine again, and that's how Samantha ends up dead. In 2002, Avila moved into an apartment complex with his mother and two sisters. On July 15th, Avila promised to cook chicken so his family could eat around 6. Instead, he decided to go for a drive because he's looking for a victim. And he drove by Catherine's home. And like I said, Catherine lived beside Samantha. And instead of spotting Catherine, he spotted Samantha. And this is when he abducted her. And her life was taken from her. The pathologist estimated that Samantha had died between 8 p.m. on the 15th of July and 2 a.m. on the 16th of July. Avila checked into a hotel shortly after 9 and eyewitnesses stated that Samantha was not with him at the time. He returned home the next day and his sister asked him where he had been. He told Elvira that he had gone to the beach the previous day and also jokingly said also went to Japan and China. He left the apartment a few minutes later and the next morning Avila did something very unusual. He took out the trash and cleaned his room, which was something he rarely did. His sister Elvira also noticed scratches on his leg, but he told her it was caused by climbing over a baby gate at their house. You know, I've climbed over a lot of baby gates, and I've never ended up with scratches. I mean, you think of it as a baby gate. It was made not to scratch a baby, so it's not going to scratch an adult. So that was the weirdest reasoning I had ever heard. After Avila was arrested, officers obtained a search warrant and was able to go into Avila's house. His computer was seized. An investigator specializing in computer crimes examined the computer. He described numerous images of children engaged in a wide variety of activities that had been deleted from the computer, but that he was able to recover. The party stipulated that the images constitute child. Also, a day before Samantha's abduction, Avila had printed out a story about a man having with his daughters and granddaughters. There was also a chat room conversation which Avila appeared to use the username Girl Lover. During these chats, he discussed his sexual desires towards children 
and even stated, I live 4,000 feet in the mountains where you can do anything to little children that you want. Police searched his car. Samantha's DNA was found inside his car, and his DNA was found under Samantha's fingernails. She was a fighter. He had scratches on his body. She scratched him. She fought for her life. A substance consistent with tears or mucus was also found on the inside door handle of Avila's car. This discovery suggested that Samantha had been crying as she tried to escape after her abduction. It's so heartbreaking. Alejandro Avila was formally charged with the death of Samantha Runyon on July 23, 2002. He was held at the Orange County Jail until his conviction in 2005. On April 28, 2005, he's convicted of kidnapping, murder, and two counts of SI. He is currently incarcerated at the San Quentin State Prison, where he awaits his end on death row. Up until Samantha Runyon's murder, California did not even have the Amber Alert system in place. However, after Samantha's tragic death, the Amber Alert was instituted in California. After the horrific murder of her daughter, Erin Runyon launched the Joyful Child Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to preventing childhood victimization through important programs designed to empower, educate, and unite families and communities. She even had the strength to go visit the place where her daughter's body had been dumped. You ready? Yeah. Okay. This is, some of this is eroded, but she was right down in this area here. Right about, so it was fairly close to this bush right here. I know this is hard. The people of Elsinore and everybody that came up put a, uh, had a real a big memorial right there. Yeah. There was an Indian spear there for. I mean, there was some, you know, and, 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 and it was very well respected, and nobody, nobody came and touched it. But I mean, we are standing. You know, you could have bent down and touched her from right here, from where we're standing right now. seems like a very strong woman. I can't imagine getting through something like this. There could be nothing worse that I can even imagine than something happened in your daughter or granddaughter. I mean, I'm fixing to be a grandmother to a little girl, and I can't imagine, and she's not even born yet, and I, I can't, I think it would be the most heartbreaking thing in the world. I already love her, and she's not even born. I can't imagine having to go through something like this. It's just heartbreaking. I'm just glad that her mother was able to find some kind of justice. And I know that her mother, from the way she talks, does believe in heaven. And I know that little Samantha has angel wings. May you rest in peace, little Samantha. All right, guys, you know I'm going to have to tell y'all bye, and you know who's going to come when I say that. <laughs> It's just natural. He hears bye and he goes, oh, we're going to go do something now. <laughs> Tell them bye. Tell them you love them. And we'll see you next time at the Murder She Shed. I know. You little boo-boo. You little boo-boo boy. He's such a sweet boy. He really is. All right. You ready to go do something? What do you want to do? You want to boo Boo-boo. When she feels alone, I wish I could tell her she's a, she's a